Um, the way this works is we have 45 minutes of discussion at this inner circle amongst the folks who are here. The rest of us in the outer circle practice active listening, mark down our thoughts, comments, things, questions that come up, and then we um, kick it out for 45 minutes of full group discussion afterwards. Um, this panel will now go until 12.30 instead of 12.15, so um, just to make that note, and off we go. Uh, hello. <laughs> so I'll just remind you that we are talking to each other, even though it's weird to talk to each other with a microphone. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and um, uh, there is rumor that I have uh, struck fear in the hearts of panelists everywhere um, by my approach of yesterday's uh, timing uh, of you. Um, and uh, I think that's a good thing. So, um, the, uh, um, so what I would love to do to start, uh, we have a really um, eclectic panel in terms of people coming from uh, really different uh, uh, places versus yesterday's panel where I think, uh, uh, you know, people coming from a, a more uh, particular artistic perspective. So what I'd like to do is have you start uh, by going around and introducing yourself. I'd like you to keep that introduction to 90 seconds, uh, but um, to really talk about what brings you to the table today. And so if you could pick kind of the key things, and then at 90 seconds, you'll see me pick up my uh, microphone and um, start to interrupt you, okay? But I'll try to do it with, with great gentleness. Um, okay, uh, so um, if uh, anybody wants to start, and then we'll just make our way around. Anybody feel ready to do an introduction? Thank you so much. All right. The person she was. Or, wait, is it on? Hello. Uh, yep. There you go. I was the person Carl was speaking of. She. Uh, Carl has scared me. <laughs> um, I am. I am um, Patricia Jones or Dr. Patricia Jones, and I am with Carpetbag Theater. I am a part of the Car Project, which is the Creative Arts Integration Project, and I'm a veteran, so I'm here at the table serving on, in that magnitude. We have a lot more time. So you want to talk a little, a little bit more? Is that all? all right, great, great. I'm trying to save mine for later. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Let's send it around. Okay. I had the benefit of introducing myself uh, earlier, so I won't reiterate that, but I'll, I'll share some things of, I, I think, why I'm, I'm on this panel. And it gets into, um, I'm actually happy and comfortable with saying I'm not an artist. Uh, I have really spent, I started out learning about the arts, and I, I have a background in the arts, but I have been very centered and, and very happy in the role of administrator and, and really lately advocate. And this is you know, part of, uh, I, I think, a culminating part of my own career as an administrator is really working in, in this field with the veterans and with the veteran artists and with the artists and everybody across the continuum. So, and for the record, again, I'm Marita Wester. I'm with Americans for the Arts, Senior Director of Arts Policy. Thank you. Um, Madison Cario, and um, gosh, I don't know where to start. I'm many things, so um, let's talk about my job. What pays the bills right now, the, I'm the director of the Office of the Arts at uh, Georgia Institute of Technology, and um, it's a really wonderful um, opportunity for me because I get to be an artist, an administrator, a curator, and the science geek that I am. So I have a background in um, environmental science and electrical engineering from the Marine Corps that I finally get to kind of come out about. And, um, <laughs> right? <laughs> so many coming outs. Um, I am uh, also, I am gonna be really honest with y'all, I'm really um, full and super um, nervous. Because uh, I will say that in this room in the last 24 hours, um, I have brought even more pieces of myself together right and this is crazy like i just just when i think that i've got it and i know how to be an administrator and a veteran and a scientist and a technologist i don't think that until this morning as i was reviewing what i was going to say that i really had a clue how deeply um moved i am like my cells are vibrating and this is amazing and i'm terrified so <laughs> i'd say some words that we can't publish so, but i'll say thank you <laughs> Hi everyone, Maurice to call. Uh, same, so a couple different levels. I am the, uh, the artist of residence at TCG. We run a program called the Veterans and Theater Institute. And what we're trying to do is to teach veterans uh, how to write plays, right? And also how to work in technical theater. So we're working in 
three sites right now. Fourth site we're hoping to get up and going in August. So Rhode Island, uh, Providence, Rhode Island with Trinity Rep Company and Brown University of Providence Community Libraries. Uh, in North Carolina with uh, Cape Fear Regional Theater, uh, 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 Fayetteville State University and Methodist College. And now we're, we just opened up our third site last week actually in San Diego with La Jolla Playhouse and we're working with the uh, MFA students in the theater program there. And the, the, the final site, the, pilot, the final pilot site, uh, ASU, and we're hoping to get that up this, this fall semester. So that's what we're doing. Um, in addition to that, I was in Marines. So I was a Marine uh, artilleryman and infantryman. I'm also a playwright, so I'm at Brown University uh, trying to find some right place. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Art DeGroat, uh, Executive Director of Military and Veterans Affairs at Kansas State University. Um, I finished my doctorate, as was mentioned yesterday, and I researched uh, the lived experience of uh, post 9 11 era veterans as they transition as a human life event from a phenomenological perspective. Um, as I also witnessed during this convening, uh, I had a, an amazing life experience witnessing the performance of Joe Good's Resilience work with veterans. Um, it became very, very personal to me, and, and I discovered the power of art as an appropriate platform for telling veteran stories and not just as an appropriate platform, but I think the, the, the prominent platform uh, where journalists, historians, uh, others really have not, in my opinion, told the, story, the human stories of veterans. Um, and, and so I think this is, a, this is one of the most important parts of my work. Um, um, I've been involved now in five veterans arts uh, programs and projects at various roles. Um, I'm definitely learning every day. This has been an important convening for me. Uh, to feel more connected to this community. Uh, so I, I'm just glad to be here, and it's a very powerful thing. I'm also scared and nervous. Um, this, is, this is a very powerful collection of people and talent, and uh, I feel really privileged to be here, but, but I'm also on, on edge. So. <laughs> Stay that way. Good morning. My name is Umoja Abdul Ahad, and uh, I'm here representing uh, Copperback Theater. Uh, I'm a Vietnam veteran, and uh, I talked to a guy the other day, and, and I told him I was a Vietnam, Vietnam veteran. He said, I thought all of y'all were dead. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a real important reason <laughs> to be around this table. Uh, I have a uh, son that's a Navy, who's in the Navy. I have a son-in-law that was in the Army. I have three grandsons that was in the service. I have one now is playing with the Army Jazz Band. He's a drummer and he's good. <laughs> <laughs> and my oldest grandson just told me two or three weeks ago, maybe a little longer, that he and his wife were expected the 22nd of this month. So when I talked last night about us really uh, looking at how we can effectively make a change and not have all the stories about war. I believe the Pentagon probably meets like this and they have no more power than we do. We can stop this. So it seems like everyone's using their NPR voice, so I will as well. Um, <laughs> My name's Sam Pressler. Uh, okay, I can't do that. Um, I'm, I listen to it every morning, uh, and I became a monthly contributor. You should too. But um, <laughs> my name's Sam Pressler. I am the uh, founder and executive director of the Armed Services Arts Partnership, uh, or ASAP, um, for the Army people, not the Alcohol and Substance Abuse Program, um, and also uh, Comedy Boot Camp. Um, I too, I'm very humbled to be at this table. I, when I was in college just starting this work, I was looking up to Maurice and Phil Klein and Matt Gallagher, and so being at the same table as Maurice is, is pretty awesome. Um, so I started this program when I was a sophomore at William & Mary. Um, was very fortunate to get a few fellowship fundings to uh, work on it full time, and have no background in the arts except for you know performing comedy when I was in high school. Um, didn't serve in the military, my grandparents did, so not, oh wow. And so what ASAP does, um, 
to make a long story short, uh, we help veterans reintegrate into their communities through the arts. We serve veterans, service members, and military families. Uh, our approach includes intro-level classes, uh, which for veterans and their families, they're about seven to 10 weeks in length, stand-up comedy, improv, creative writing, storytelling. They all culminate with public performances, and then our big thing is not uh, stopping there, we provide long-term alumni support through workshops, meetups, performances, etc. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Um, my name is Nolan Bivens. I come to you this morning by way of oh, a little over 32 years of active duty military service. I retired as a general officer back in 2008, and I'm kind of at the table by virtue of a relationship with uh, Bob Lynch, of uh, Americans for the Arts. And I would say I'm here primarily because of the strong and passionate feeling I have about uh, the subject we're talking this morning is, is healing. And uh, what I believe is that healing happens within community. I wish I could have quoted that, but that comes from another book that I've read, but it resonated with me. And I think it is a collector that allows me to think about this work of bridging uh, military and art communities with that one notion that healing occurs in community and it's just not the physical, the mental, the social uh, aspect of it, but it is the whole concept of healing. And so what I spend my time today, uh, these days doing uh, outside of running a business is uh, passionately advocating to all of those that I can influence with this notion of how art can contribute tremendously to the, the benefit of our veterans, their families, uh, as well, and I think the family is a key component that, that we may get a chance to talk about a little later. Thank you so very much. Thank you, uh, thank you for that. That was great, and um, I'll turn my timer off now. Just I'd like to get everybody's voice in the room to start, which is really uh, great, and um, so thank you. Uh, you know, you, you, uh, you have all eclectic backgrounds, but you're all um, referencing the power of art um, uh, some of you as um, with experience in the arts and some of you coming more from the outside. I just wonder if you could reflect a little bit personally because I feel um, in a way uh, this conversation has gone deep fast over the course of this one day and a morning that we've been together. Um, and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about uh, the, the, you know, I think to use um, art's word, uh, the power of the art, like even if you want to talk anecdotally a little bit about that or in your direct experience about that, I'd love to, to just put that in the, into the center of the table. Okay, so Patricia again. Um, for me personally, um, that's what I'll bring into this to answer your question. Um, I am a veteran, and in when I got, after I got out, I went to graduate school after a while. I ended up in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, working on my doctorate. And I had a class where a group of local artists or activists came into the space and introduced what they were doing. And for the class assignment, I was to go and do some work with one of these groups. And just so happened, Carpetback Theater, Linda Paris Bailey and Andrea um, were present. And they were discussing the peace speed. And as I sat there as a veteran at that time, no one knew I was a veteran. Um, I didn't identify as a veteran. And um, I knew I had to work with them. After I heard them describe that piece from last night, I had to work with them. And so I committed to doing that. And Linda invited me as my assignment to participate in a story circle. And I don't even think um, Linda was aware of it, um, but after I participated in that story circle, that was the first time I ever told my story, ever. No one knew my story. The only person who knew that story after I told it and those in that circle was my professor who read the paper that I wrote about it. Um, so I share my story with this group of Moj was present and it was received in such a powerful way, a powerful way. I was in a place where I, my story had been taken from me. My narrative had been taken, I was robbed of my story and my narrative. And I was just existing and not living because I was in fear. I was on that brink where life could, for me, was almost over. But I came into that space. I told that story of me suffering 
from PTS or PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and how I ended up becoming a felon because of an act that was committed that I didn't have a title for, I didn't know how to name until several physicians within the VA told me that it was PTSD. This thing exists, and I told them they were crazy because I was not a Vietnam vet. No offense to you. Um, <laughs> this was not real, you know? I am not an old, you know? So um, I also came to discover, you know, I, I, I do also, you know, I experience military sexual trauma as well. And I know that that's not a lived experience for every woman or male within the military, but it happened to me. And that was the first time ever in that circle that I was able to say that. And after I left that space, my life was changed. And that's why I'm here. And it took, I don't even know how many years later, it was a lot of years later, just reason. <laughs> Linda and Andrea and Moja and others who were in that circle, I, were, I was able to share with them that story and the impact it had on me, being able to share that with you, with them. But Carpetbag didn't stop there. They invited me to take my story and change it into a digital story, but I had to do it myself. So I had to go through their train the trainers program. So I wrote my story in 30, 300 words or less and created a, mini, a video, a digital story, which is like three minutes with images and everything about my story. And then I went and started pursuing that even deeper. And I started to do that with um, Story Center as well, the Center of Digital Storytelling with Joe Lambert. And um, now I'm a digital storytelling facilitator, but I am the owner of my story. And that's what I want to help others do, be it veterans or not, because we are human and what we experience are human issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you so enough. much. I would add um, about the uh, the power of the art. I think there's kind of uh, in, um, internal and external powers. Um, I really think it's very powerful where, when the creative class is is uh, intermixed with the warrior class, um, and I think the real audience is is our non-veterans, um, mm -hmm. and and so that's the that's the majority of people. I mentioned this the other day. Um, um, that they don't, they're not exposed to the, these stories and, and the reality of those that voluntarily serve in, the, in uniform, um, not, not as heroes and, and not as victims, uh, as, as a life choice. So, so I think it's very, most, it's very powerful for me and my work to use the creative work of, of you here um, towards, towards get, having a voice to the, to the uh, civilian audience. Uh, we've heard a lot at this conference about how reinforcing it is, how therapeutic, it is uh, for those that have served. Uh, your, your, your work is, is, is representing their lives in a very appropriate and honor, uh, honorable way. Um, and that's important, but I think largely it's, it's the external audience. And it's kind of interesting that uh, you know, most people that go uh, in the military warrior class uh, are very disconnected from the arts world and very, very few veterans. It's hard to bring a veteran or a currently serving military onto our campus, 17 miles from an army base, and, and with free tickets and a bus and, and all kinds of incentives um, to bring them into a theater. Um, and, uh, and it shouldn't be that way, but once they do, this becomes a part of their lives. And, and, and so I guess my last comment would be is, as I hope through all this work, we're doing social work and, and art as a catalyst to understanding this, but, but I think uh, there's also a value of, of bringing the arts into the lives of our, of our military and veterans, and, and that's missing. They get entertainment, they get entertained, they don't get art. Uh, and I think they deserve that, and I'm a veteran, and I felt the power of my own life of the art, and, uh, and so, so that's a gift uh, intrinsic to, to them, and that, that community that doesn't get art. So uh, I'll kind of come at this um, probably from like the VSO approach. Is any other VSOs at the table? Okay, cool. Um, so I think the first piece is thinking about accessibility. Uh, it's particularly in the veteran service space, you typically see the newer type of VSO organizations are um, not that diverse, right? It's, it's younger post 9-11 veterans, uh, oftentimes white. Um, and sometimes more biased towards officers than enlisted. Uh, what we've found through our programs, at least, is just you get 
an incredible diversity through those programs. So we have in any one writing group uh, that we do in Hampton Roads in DC, we'll have someone who's just out of the service and 90, 92 year old World War II veterans. And that's because the nice thing about writing or some of these things is it is accessible. Um, so we, there you see a, a really diverse uh, range of ages. I think racially, um, this is something that has surprised me personally, is you know, right now uh, over 50% of the people who participate in our programs are people of color. Um, when you compare that to the overall veterans population in this country, 82% are Caucasian. Uh, so we're finding at least that the arts are bringing out um, a lot of the more underrepresented veterans. And then finally, um, you know, less than 10% of veterans are women yet 40% of the people who participate in our program are females. Uh, and considering that we do stand-up comedy, which is a very male-dominated um, uh, art form, we're, we're finding uh, that our classes are usually 40 to 50% female. So I think the accessibility piece is important. I think the second piece I'd like to talk about is the diversity of what can come from the arts, right? It's, you know, for us as art educators, we're not guiding towards a therapeutic outcome. That is, we're expressly saying that we don't do that because we're not qualified to do that. But what can come of that, when you give people an opportunity to build skills and have a community and express yourself, that can create a renewed sense of purpose, an expansion of that identity beyond just being defined by what happened in the past, but what you're contributing moving forward. Um, and, it, and for some, healing benefits, right? I think the other piece to what Art says is, giving those veterans a platform and a voice on stage and having them tell their stories to an audience uh, of civilians or people who are less connected, that boosts awareness, that boosts understanding, um, and ideally that boosts more engagement, right? We're bringing those communities closer together. Uh, so I, I think just the diversity of what can come from it is really important. That's great, Sam. I want to add to that, um, thinking about joy and invitation, to taking accessibility to invitation. And what I found um, in my work at Georgia Tech with engineers and with veterans is this um, notion of, um, I used to do that. Or, yeah, I played piano, but that was before, right? Fill in the blank. Before I served, before I got back. Um, and so, you know, just through conversation, lunch is a lesson learned from the conversation yesterday. Lunch is a great way to start. Um, and you start by just being in the room. And what I found is whether it's engineers or engineers who are also vets, um, we will start there and then, well, what do you do? And I'm embarrassed to tell them, like, I come in as a vet, right? And I'm like, I'm a vet. And then I go, I'm also the director of the Office of the Arts. And they're like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I knew you weren't just having lunch with us, right? You have an agenda. You know, and we just let, we let that lie. And usually it lies when I hand the card, right, on my way out. I'm like, here's my card. And they're like, oh, I didn't even know we had arts. And, um, and, and then we come back and we have this conversation. And then they say, well, what do you do? And I'm like, well, you know, dance, theater. I'm like, oh, well, I used to, right? And we start there. I'm like, oh, you used to play the trumpet. Well, we, we've got extra ones. If you ever want to, if you ever want to, you know, just get on the horn again. And they're like, really? I could do that? And so... Um, not necessarily making things. We just found a lot of joy um, and community just through the practice of um, what people used to do. Or I never thought about writing, but I, I, you know, I've been journaling all the time. Is this is this art? Am I allowed to call myself an artist? Is what I'm making artistic, right? And so language equity and. Um, uh, welcoming everyone into the room has been a really important part of the practice, um, both at Georgia Institute of Technology and the work that I'm doing, but also as a vet, as I, you know, transboundary and keep going back and forth between those things. So just to answer the question, I'll answer it on two levels. Answer it as a veteran who ended up in a writing space mm -hmm. and someone who now facilitates those, those sorts of spaces. So. 2008, I was waiting for the new, new GI Bill to come into place. I needed something to do. I'd taken a year from school for it to wait, so I wasn't burning benefits. So I ended up at a writing workshop at New York University, right? uh, the Veterans Writing Workshop. And what they have been doing since 2000, academic year 8 9, is creating a space for veterans of, at that time, mostly Iraq and Afghan, but it's, it's expanded um, to get together and write you know, uh, poetry and, and fiction. So I showed up, uh, they were teaching poetry, I thought this was a waste of my time. <laughs> it's not useful to me. I was gonna, you know, I was gonna end up being a, uh, the goal was to be a federal police officer. What do I need to learn how to write a sonnet for? But what I actually found was a community of people. Um, I made friends, you know some of these folks, 
right? So I've made, I made friends, and that's why I kept going back. And then I realized, with the exception of the person I was working with, a guy named Seamus, I hadn't talked about the war. I talked about the war with Seamus because Seamus was a Marine. He was in 3-7, and we could talk about it, you know? And he and I talked, but I never talked about the war, but it was affecting me. So getting back, getting into a room like that, and actually learning how to process the war through poetry was life-changing. I ended up not being a police officer, obviously. Now, and that would have been a fine choice, but you know, it took a different route in life. Um, now we are able to facilitate these sorts of workshops across the country, and we invite folks into the theater and give them access. But the first thing we do is, and I've been saying this to the people who facilitate the workshops, is what we're really doing is building community. Like these folks are not, they have not all served together, right? They're different branches, different eras, but we are facilitating community. You bring people in a room, you're giving them space, we feed them, depending on the workshop. In San Diego, I mean, they're like feeding. But uh, we facilitate works, we facilitate a uh, space where people can just build community, make friends, right? And then we take them to the theater so they get to see the shows, they get to see the season if they want to. And we teach them a thing, we teach them a skill. And at the end of the workshop, the goal is to be able to uh, uh, present that work on the stage publicly if they want it, uh, invite their friends, invite people from the community. So it's, you know, but the first and most important thing is building, building the community. That's what I learned. I learned that last year in a real way when we did our first workshop in San Diego, because that's what I saw. Um, whatever else comes out of it, that's great, but it's really, you know, community. That's it. So um, I always feel of myself in this space as a learner and the great joy of being in this space since, literally only since about 2011, is that every single day I learn something new that changes the way I not only think about this work, it changes the way I, I do this work. And I, I think, I, I just wanna talk about my experience with how the arts have um, helped me in that learning journey by just describing a little bit of a, a timeline of how transformational internally this has been. Uh, when Americans for the Arts first came into the space, we were invited into a dialogue. You know, we did not initiate it. It was happening at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. It was the, you know, impetus was the extreme number of, um, wounded returning back from Iraq and Afghanistan with serious physical and, and psychological injuries. Uh, the arts, as I came to learn, had a long history of being part of war theaters, being part of the military, being part of, of this, uh, that coming from a civilian population, and I want to echo everything that's been said about the great tragedy and imperative we need to bridge this military and civilian gap because it manifests in very serious um, <laughs> ways in our society today. And when we first had this dialogue, uh, we held a summit called Arts and Healing for Wounded Warriors and Walter Reed was fantastic. They were able to bring a military and, and veteran population together with uh, arts folks, the, the creative class, if, if you will, uh, in healing professionals, healthcare professionals. And what we learned from that dialogue was, and it was loud and clear, it's like, if you wanna help the wounded warrior, you don't stop there. You have, to, you have to be about the family. You have to look at the circle of, of caregivers. You have to look at the community. So we changed our minds. And then we started looking at um, the continuum of, of the arts, which um, if you're looking just at the healing continuum, and I, I, I think I'm gonna end with just saying, I'll, I'll warn you that the healing continuum is only one part of this larger artistic ecosystem that needs to be uh, brought together and, and needs to be looked at as the ultimate holistic system. But if you look at the healing continuum, you know, what I started to learn was creative arts therapist, those who are licensed working in art therapy, music therapy, we're gonna hear a lot you know, more about that. Um, they have not necessarily been new to this environment, but they have been in VA systems. They've been part of a closed system that doesn't necessarily allow their work and their benefits to be as visible as we have the luxury of being on the nonprofit side. 
But when you look at the manifestations of that, and I'll give a very, very specific example, um, there is, relatively speaking, given the size of the agency, handfuls of creative arts therapists working in VAs. And the expression of, of that, I was introduced to by a very long-serving VSO, Veteran Service Organization, American Legion Auxiliary, largest volunteer association, women who have been supporting arts in our veterans' medical facilities for a very, very long time uh, through the National Veterans Creative Arts Festival. And the first time I went to the festival, uh, which is the culmination of a lot of work that happens at the, at the local level, a lot of work. And we um, were able to tour the exhibit of visual artists who were the recipients of you know, the, the medals in the in competition and see the performances. What I was struck by, and I was really new, this was probably um, you know, 2012, 2013, and they may have started, each and every one of these service members, and it was completely intergenerational. You know, from Vietnam to Gulf War to whomever was part of this larger system. And that's when I also understood, you know, there's the, the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts, sadly, but also positively, um, initiated a different kind of conversation that allows us into an intergenerational space. And, and when I talked with um, every single one, and I, and I talked to every single one, they may have started out that art is therapeutic or I'm addressing therapy needs or I'm doing this. When they were in front of their artwork describing what they were doing, they were artists, they were talking as artists. That was the transformational journey. And then further probing that along, again, the continuum, you know, artist, patient to artist, but then, they were talking about, and you know, there's a gallery in my local arts district that I'm gonna be in a show, or I'm gonna be doing you know, this, and I'm connecting with the community. And then we kind of fast forward a, a, a couple of other uh, years, and along these same trajectories, I start to meet all of the fabulous veteran artists that are out there, um, and I learned a lot from people like Roman Baca, Maurice, people who are like, it's like, hey, you know, the thing is, it's a fallacy to say you have to bring arts to service members and veterans. When we had the draft, artists were drafted, you know, and you return to what you, you do. We don't have the draft now. That doesn't mean artists didn't sign up. And when people return this reintegration, it's, it's a fallacy that the arts are only about therapy and therapeutic and educational, they are about, and we need this. And I wholly endorse, you know, the brilliance of we need those veteran artists' voices and the experience because we have a populace that is largely clueless and uneducated and disconnected. So we need the voices that are about in engagement. We also need to know that for our own creative industry, um, and and I will credit this quote forever to Joe Bethanti, the poet laureate, former. State Poet Laureate in North Carolina, who made Veterans Issues his um, his project. You know, he said that you know, in, in his mind, the stories that are coming out from veterans are really the, some of the most significant historical underpinnings of what is going to be our our cultural voice. And we need to look at how we, as a creative industry, integrate those voices and elevate those voices and yep. support those voices. Yep. And great. I'm done. <laughs> Thanks. Great. <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm going to hand you this one right over here. There you go. <clears throat> yeah, the uh, great comment before, because the people who did get drafted were many things. And uh, and uh, as, I, as I think about the arts and, and all the other, I guess, facets of human life and how we can make a difference and make a change, I, I, the word comes to me, the two words really, is change agent. And I think that... Uh, that's what we should see ourselves as. And what I work on myself is, is trying to, to be that change that you want everything else to be. I try to actually work on that personally, because that's where it really happens, as you very well know, it's actually personally. And 
so I've seen over the years uh, how that how that happens, how it really works, and I definitely have seen it as a community. And we talk about community, common unity, how we actually can make a change. But I think when we're in settings like this, we're comfortable. You know, we're in our comfort zone. But when we go home, it's like art or whatever it may be, you know, somebody thinks little of you or less of you, so you don't actually express yourself, your true self, when you're around other people. Because my granddaddy used to say, it's easy to be black in the black community, <laughs> but it ain't quite easy when you're around other people and they talking about you and saying names and you got to say, well, hey, that ain't cool. Because they may, you know, fire you, you know, or do whatever. So I want us to, from now on, say what ain't cool <laughs> around people who need to hear it. They need to hear it. They need to hear it, because that's a change agent. That's a change agent. Now, I'm in Vietnam, and I'm sitting around, and all the guys, like Latin, Latinos, European Americans from you know Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, we sitting around, and everybody said, man, this is crazy. What are we doing over here in Vietnam? So one only African American said, no Vietnamese has called me nigger. It was everybody. Everybody, and I want you to hear this carefully because this story is very seldom told. You knew that on Kent State, kids were getting killed because of Vietnam. You knew that uh, Jackson State and all these other places. But in Vietnam, people who were driving tanks and, fire, and driving planes and shooting M16s and M whatever, they were saying, this is crazy. What am I doing over here? So we united in Vietnam. Now, go, go look at a movie called Sir, Yes Sir, No Sir. I think it's what it's called. But it's about Vietnam veterans in Vietnam saying the same thing the students were saying on campus, saying the same thing that people were saying everywhere. Now, when you got a guy driving a tank saying this is crazy, he may turn that tank around. And everybody knew that. And when he's driving a B-52, and he's over somebody, and he said, oh, man, this is crazy. He may turn that plane around. And that's what happened. Uh, I used to wear what is called an Afro. And in the Air Force, and in the branch of the service, you can't do that. You got to have a certain kind of hairstyle. So I had my family send me some tuxedo. I don't know if you know what a tuxedo is. It's a real thick grease makes your hair stand down on your head. And so I had my hair down and all the rest. So every night when I would go to dawn, you know, we had, I was in the Air Force as a security policeman. So you'd have to stand up and how straight you are, your shoes shine, and all the rest. And they would always say something about my hair. Man, will you please cut your hair, blah, blah, blah. And this is in Vietnam. So I came in one morning, there's a guy from Philadelphia, and I'll be brief. He was a barber. And so I asked him, I said, do you know how to shave heads? He said, yes, I do. I said, I don't want you to shave my head. He said, what? I said, because if I can't wear my hair the way I want to wear my hair, I'm not going to have any hair at all. We were 548 guys in that unit. That morning I got my hair shaved. They said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. When we came to work that night, there was 545 <laughs> people. 540 change agents. I'm talking about being a change agent. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. All shaved their heads. Yeah. One by about four or five guys didn't shave their heads. Huh. That next day, we had orders to be separated. Yes, indeed. I was at, I was at uh, Fan Rank. No, yeah, I was at Fan Rank. The next day, they sent me to Benoit. And they separated us. They sent us to Danang, Quan Tree, and all the rest. So I'm just saying that using the arts as one thing, important, but use your life. Everything that you do, if you don't like what's going on, Change it, change it. But don't be afraid, don't be afraid to say it in front of other people who may think something's wrong with you because something's wrong with them. <laughs> it's something wrong with all of us. I, got on, I don't end in with this, I got on the bus the other day. I do a lot of walking, I try to walk 10 miles a day. Turn 70, 10th of February, right on, right on, right on. I got on the bus and this guy, this guy said to me, European American young guy. He said, uh, hey brother, we the same, man, we the same. I said, we sure are. 
He said, but people are scared of you. I said, scared of me? Why? He said, because you're different. I said, everybody on this bus is different. <laughs> I mean, ain't nobody on this bus the same. Everybody on this bus is different. So we're different. But let's make our difference great. Yes. Yes. So, um, Nolan, I want to um, I want to actually let you jump in because we uh, we're only going to get through one question in this uh, panel. Um, but uh, yeah, it was a it was a good question. It was a really good question. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, the power of the arts. I think that was the core. Uh, yeah. in, in the, in the question. And I, I think we see the power of it. And 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 I do have to pause uh, for the. Uh, other um, veterans that are around the table with me this morning, and I feel obligated uh, to make sure you all know uh, to whom much is given, much is expected. And I consider my life really one of being exceptionally blessed. So I have to say to you all, thank you for your service. I feel a special commitment to say that to you this morning. And for whatever that may resonate with you, just take it as coming very sincere for me. Because I think that it kind of leads to the thought about the power of the arts. Uh, I think the power of the arts, as I have come into this, is that it creates a pathway for experience between the two communities. And experience is, is the core of what I realized that, that I, while I had it, I didn't take it into my day-to-day -day existence as a soldier. Though it was always around me. I, I'll never forget, I, I re, I, when I changed command as a brigade commander, the, the sergeant major came in with this big picture. I'll tell you what my family thinks about it later. But it, it came in with this big, uh, huge uh, picture that an artist in my community, in, the, in my command, had decided to make of me, of a picture. And I was totally flabbergasted because I am the most humble person in the world. I was totally embarrassed. And, and the point of what it resonated to me was that to your point that the artists are in the military. Uh, I later on became chief of staff at Southern Command and the boss came in and says, hey, I want to create a band. What? It's a military organization. And it was a joint organization of that. So we created a band and we just put a call out and said, hey, we're going to create a band. We want to go around Latin, Central, South America and we want to use this as a tool to do cultural diplomacy. And this person came out, became the drummer, that person had a horn, two or three of them had guitars that we didn't know they had, and three months later we were touring. <laughs> uh, it really was a, a huge experience. So, so I think the, the, the point of that is the power of the arts, I think, creates a pathway for experience with communities. Um, and, and I think that that is really important when it comes to the military community today and the civilian community. Uh, many in the room have heard me say, I think there's, there's more similarity than there's disparity. Uh, I would ask you to just think about this uh, for a moment. You know, what's the difference between Sandy Hook, the battle for Fallujah, and the crisis that we're experiencing with, between the uh, police force and our communities today? What's the, what's, what's the difference and what's the commonality on that? And I think the fact that there's trauma across all of that spectrum means that what military service members are experiencing in combat is very similar to what our grade school kids are experiencing in grade school. And our communities are uh, full of that. And so when we talk about helping our service members, we really talk about helping our community. This, it's, a huge, it's a huge connection there in my mind right now. And, and it comes back to this notion that I think power, art creates this pathway for experience for us to start communicating, start sharing those experiences, out of the experience you begin to understand, once you begin to understand, the communication is open. And, and I will say this because yesterday, one of the powerful thoughts that came to my mind is that group was, were talking, and, and someone said this, and, and I think it's this idea that whatever you do as an artist or whatever we try to do as a community of artists, always at the time that you're creating, and that's what I love about artists because they're always creating. My, I understand that now more than ever, but when you create, be intentional about collaborating with the military. Make collaboration an intentional part of your creativity because I think that's when you're gonna draw that, again, experience very early on that portrays itself in the work that you're doing and the healing that you're trying to help with. Thank you. Uh, this is great. Um, uh, just a couple things to say, I mean, there's, uh, it's interesting that 
in some ways, this um, gathering is is premised a bit on the notion of divide, right? Like that there's there's differences in these communities, and we're trying to bridge that divide. And then I think this conversation is, of course, um, kind of upends that notion um, about um, the real connection um, that exists, and it's actually elevating those connections versus um, you know starting with divide. So I feel like that um, is really great. And I think Nolan, you ended us on a on a really important point about um, just the uh, the way we um, how to do this work well, um, like how do we do it well together? And I think that's really feels like where this conversation is headed. So how do we do this work well? And and then and just to kind of pull one other thing out, which I think is like just, you know, true for every single person that sits in the room, which is the fundamental need to be able to be the voice of our own story, right? Just that fundamental need. And so um, I kind of just put those things out there. What we're going to do is shift gears. Um, we're going to stop talking amongst ourselves with microphones. And... Um, we are gonna, um, uh, you'll go back to s your seats and then we'll open this up uh, to a broader conversation. So, but thank you so much for that, thank you. And sometimes it's hard for me to ask people questions. But I made a commitment that when I got in front of prominent individuals in the space, I would challenge them with a question specifically surrounding art in the military. And I'm happy to report that um, officers like General Petraeus and um, a national security advisor that I had an opportunity to bend the ear of, um, when you challenge them with anecdotes about the connection of art in the military, each and every one of them has one. My favorite one is from a former commandant of the Marine Corps, Jim Jones. Uh, he was tasked with going into Hezbollah. He was fighting Hezbollah, and you'll have to excuse me, I don't remember the country, cold. <laughs> um, and they asked him um, what the... It, 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 he was in the Pentagon, and he was going around, and he was touting cultural diplomacy and and... and connecting community, and his buddies in the Pentagon were like, Jim, like, why are you talking about cultural diplomacy? Like, you have every military asset at your command. You can basically go in there and, I'll borrow some words from this morning, turn the country to glass. And yet, you're talking about cultural diplomacy. He said, you know, we are there and Hezbollah is winning. And let me tell you why Hezbollah is winning, because Hezbollah is going in and they're giving money to the hospitals, and they're connecting with the community. And in the future, that is how we're going to win wars. Thank you. Thank you. Art, and then uh, who's next up after Art? Is there another? Yeah, right here. Thank you. I'm going to speak from sitting down because I'm always, always shorter and more to the point when I sit than stand. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why that is. But uh, I want to kind of respond uh, uh, about, b back a little bit about how, the, how does the warrior community and the artistic community work. And I think in my example, uh, I, I think there's, and we see it in this, this forum, um, there's some of us that are intermediaries. Um, we were veterans. We have cultural capital in that community, even as veterans, as, as formerly serving. And, and so we have generals and sergeant majors and friends that we can talk to every day. So, so we have cultural capital still in that community, yet through these forums and the work we do um, brought in with the opportunities with, with uh, arts projects, we also start to build some of that. And, and so uh, one thing about cultural capital, it's transferable. Um, so I can go to the general at Fort Riley and say, hey, we want, we're bringing uh, Bass Track Live uh, to, to our campus community, a theater. Um, um, we'd want to bring the cast out to your post. Um, he would allow me, to, he would trust my opinion that that's appropriate more than his entertainment director as a government employee. Um, so, so I think the point is um, how we do this work moving forward is we need to develop more intermediaries, uh, people that have cultural capital in both sides of the, of the artist, artistic community and the military veterans community, uh, and that helps uh, everyone. And, and uh, Annie Hamburger kind of mentioned my role, she very flattering how my role was in bass track, um, but it was. I, I, I got to do things that, that was really hard for her to do, hard for the presenter to do, um, hard for the booking agents, uh, hard for the creative people, um, but I could get things done for, that, for them that they couldn't do for themselves. Um, and, and so I think that's a, 
a role that should be developed and talked about in all these projects moving forward? Who, who is your intermediary after you choose a project? That's great. Thank you. Uh, you're up and then uh, Helen back there. Uh, Andrew C. Mosley with Carpet Back Theater uh, and Deborah and Speed Kill My Cousin. I am so glad that, that and, and I can't find you visually. No. Yes, looking right at me as a matter of fact. Um, that you made the comment in regards to uh, the, the school community and uh, what's going on with the war and what's the difference in the war and this kind of thing. And I'll tell you why. I posed the question yesterday in a discussion that we had about a dilemma that I go through. I, I, um, in the land of pretend, I play an Iraq veteran and have been on tour for the last six months or so as such. And um, one of the dilemmas that I was running into even last night and uh, have ran at, throughout rehearsals and things like that is my mentality in regards to this particular character, this particular soldier and so forth. And, and there's a lot of concentration on mastering being something that I'm clearly not, right? And, and you know, how do I, what, what am I sitting right? Am I looking right? Is that how your head goes? Is that the way they are? They are, they are. And there's this dilemma that has grown with me through the process that I've been trying, to, that we've, we have to talk out consistently as a cast because it makes me very upset. Um, is this us and them, us and them. I can't seem to get right being one of them, you know? them and and what I have gradually learned throughout the process of this role and interaction with veterans um, and interaction with the military community and workshops uh, with folks with PTSD and so forth and so forth and so forth is this we are the same it's just a different narrative it's the same pain it's the same trauma it's the same everything and until that character became a human being for me I couldn't walk, I can totally be a human being. And so I am so glad that you uh, began that conversation about the fabric of that. And it is very helpful um, to those of us in the arts that are trying to walk those characters out to remain human. And then it all makes sense to me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it'll be Helen and then. Uh, Helen Stoltzfus, uh, Black Swan Arts and Media, Oakland. Maybe because I'm sitting on the outer circle, I'm, I feel like I'm, uh, I want to ask a question sort of as an outsider or standing outside for a minute. We talk about uh, military and non-military, that they are to each other often the other. You know, there's this gap there. And that is very true. I would like us to see th this conflict, this gap in a, in a larger context of our society, uh, which sees many communities as the other. I mean, that's our dilemma. I, I don't know if everyone agrees with this, but I think we are trying to figure out, as a society, as an American society, how can we live together? How can we find what we have in common and build on that? That's what I feel like I want to do as an artist and what I think many of us here are trying to do. So I want to expand the question. Um, so from, from General Bivens um, saying, make, make the military the intentional partner in your collaboration, I want to say make the other. We now live in a society where, you know, Muslims get attacked on the street. I just took a friend who's a Muslim from Iran to the airport. She's self-deporting because she can't deal with the stress anymore of what people say to her and of her life being turned upside down. So this is not unrelated to this conference, to this issue, because these issues are all part of a larger issue of how do we listen to the other? Yes, we want to hear our stories told on stage, and that is important. It's really important for veterans to tell their story and to hear their story on stage. Can they sit in a theater and listen to the story of an Iraqi, of an Afghan, of a Muslim? If we can't do that, then we can't figure out how to live together, and that to me is the larger issue with within which all of these questions sit. It's, it's the larger context, so. Um, so, uh, I have some thoughts on that. I, I will let other people get to that with more well thought out thoughts. Um, so, there was one question that was asked in advance of us that I think uh, 
given the moment we're in is worth also throwing out there. And it's, is it possible to be critical of the military but still work as an artist in collaboration with you? I thought that was a really interesting question. Um, and the second point was, or are there boundaries around subject matters that can be taken on by artists? And I think uh, I will concede my age, like I don't, I haven't experienced this globally, but there have been peaks and troughs in terms of support for veterans in the military. Obviously, in Vietnam, it was a low point. Iraq and Afghanistan, it's been a relative high point. We're now, I've started to experience this, uh, potentially the start of a trough, um, both with uh, the administration coming in and their kind of zero-sum mentality towards military spending versus domestic spending. And, and we're, it's, to some, it feels like you're taking from what we're doing at home to bolster an already large budget. And I think what's so important in this is to actually find the artists who may not be supportive of the military. I, I want to work with people who have never worked with the military because that's how we invite people into these experiences. So you can, so my concern in, in all of this is that we go back to that place with Vietnam and we do what we're doing right now with local law enforcement officers. Um, I, I will concede as a white male, I don't uh, you know, experience the brunt of the criminal justice system. I know the criminal justice system is broken, but I also know there are humans who are police officers who are doing their jobs in a broken system. And I, my concern in all of this is that we dehumanize the veteran and the, mil the, veteran and the service member in the same way that in some regards we've dehumanized the police officer. Um, and I just, that's kind of, why I want to invite in these people who may not have had that connection to speak to maybe their constituencies that have um, that disconnect. Yeah, I think you raise a really interesting question. Um, uh, in part, um, that question that we didn't get to about uh, what are the topics that we can't take on or what are the disconnects, um, in part stems from um, having been arrested for trespassing on uh, government property at a naval nuclear weapons station when I was in my 20s. Um, and um, uh, <coughs> so having some very strong feelings about the military at that time. Uh, and, um, and so I wonder if maybe we could even talk about that a little bit about, I mean, we're talking about a lot of the things that connect us, but what are the things that, um, and we don't, we don't have to go here, but uh, we might want to go here, what are the things that are, are real challenges in terms of that connection? So uh, yeah, Mike, and did I miss somebody else? So, is there a two? Yes, and then back there, yeah. For, back Hi, I'm Michael Reed from ASU, uh, ASU, Arizona State University, Gamage. And um, I've heard an incredible amount of information over the past day and almost a half, overwhelmingly so, I would say. Um, we've done a lot of work with military over the, at, least, at least the past 15, more like 20 years in regard to programs for military families and working with wonderful artists that are in this room, uh, the folks from Bass Track, Carpet Bag, Holding It Down, Veterans Dream Project. And in the space of being an arts presenter on the largest state university campus in the country, in all these very large, complex, issues we're talking about. I'm trying to, at the end of the day when we leave here, I'm trying to, I want to try and, from that idea of all politics are local, somehow operationalize some of these massive ideas that I personally cannot take on, but I can take on pieces of connecting people who would other, otherwise would not be talking to each other. So, in the best ways possible, and I invite any conversations that might happen in the next day um, to help me in that quest, um, I want to affect some micro change so that it can plant seeds where we are and continue to maybe move towards a macro change. Um, I don't have the answers. Uh, we've tried some things that have worked really well, and I think the point about intermediaries is a very important one when we're talking about this type of work with stories about veterans who have seen combat and most of us have not. So know what you don't know. So I'd like to explore that and we've done that to a certain point most recently with the great folks at Carpetbag. So I'm just sort of putting that out on the table to examine because these are monstrous, very large complex issues we're talking about 
where in each when we go back home? How can we plant that seed or start a little network that is addressing some of these things? And that's, I'm going to be concentrating on that. Yes, uh, so, so, you're, so you're spot on the, the point you make about operationalizing and, and it, it is a big idea. So let me just come right down to the rubber meet the road. I think that a way, just a thought, everyone sitting in this room um, probably is a part of some group, some foundation, some artistic adventure. How about just invite one military person to sit on your advisory board. Start there. Intentionally. Because you want that voice to be brought in and you want that voice to be, that's very simple. I mean, that's why I went down to that level. And I'm not pointing at you necessarily, but I was trying to give it as a generic example of how you can really practically do something right today, change your community by saying, I am gonna have that voice sitting around the table when I create. Because it begins to uh, to happen there, I, I was just going to say, uh, given a lot of the additional comments was made from the outer circle, that I think we have to always remember, and this is what mis demystifies, is I think for a lot of the military folks, is that uh, we are talking about human experience. When, when you talk about a person, Vietnam, and I know also a couple of real World War II Korean veterans, who, who kind of still live under their beds, and and the point of that is. It's a human experience that we're beginning to engage on and what we're trying to participate in and being a part of. And particularly now, I think we need to be aware that, I think Marita talked to this, is that th this truly is a spectrum, but it's a spectrum in a lot of ways. It's from the child, the family, the service member, and it expands all the way out to, to the entire organization. But it's also a spectrum in the sense of, of, of going from healing, particularly creative art therapists being a part of that community, all the way out to just dealing with this general human experience, I think that you were referring to a moment ago about we all are experiencing trauma. So how do we deal with that? That's huge, those are huge perspectives. So I think you have to figure out where, where's my dot in that, that, that matrix, you know, from individual uh, experience all the way out to community and from the fact that I'm trying to deal with healing or am I just trying to address this bigger or wider issue in the, in the culture. And, and I wanted to just kind of close with this idea that as we do this, particularly in the, in the military community, I'm reminded of a, of a quote that uh, I always try to live by, is that it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness, right? And so a lot of times in the military experience, and this gets to, I think, the reentry point that was made, I think, uh, at the end, that we recognize that when you jump into this thing, you're jumping into a, a, a possible potential state of darkness, right? It's just the nature of, of combat, it's the nature of war, you're gonna probably go down that path. But if we do it also with the idea that I can light the candle at the end, that will also bring balance to our efforts and our, I think our initiatives. At least that's, that's what I try to maintain as I uh, counsel and talk about these things is I want to light the candle, but I know sometimes the talking about the darkness is going to be very, very necessary to get to that point. But I do it so intentionally knowing that I have to have that balance. And, and I think if we do that, because there's a lot of ways and a lot of opportunities that that you can then put that balance in terms of not just focusing on one side and really create the idea of what I call the total experience of the military community. Um, uh, my oldest daughter beats me up with this all the time. She, she says, we got to remember the children. And she says that because she came through my experience as a child. And so if you talk with her, she will like in reentry, that there, there could be a child standing there telling a story too. And, and so she's investing her life in trying to create that story because it's so important. You will not understand the, the military experience. I mean, every person here in the military that's got experience will tell you that aspect that their family was vital and significant to whatever happened in their lives. But oftentimes when you see it portrayed, it's portrayed from the service members or the spouses that was actually in the military perspective, not from the family or through that particular lens. So I just strike that as balance, and I'll sit down and shut up like my mom told me. Uh, I think you, and then, yes, you? Were you to get to that next one? We have fire down here. Okay, great. And then Liz. Okay. You and then Liz, yeah. Um, and so one, one of the things that I, that I keep hearing, um, and I think it, it seems like one of the more important questions that keeps ruminating is, you know, is, is, is how do we continue to look at bridging that gap and, you know, and, um, not just bringing in military personnel who may happen or 
happen to have been artists previously. Um, obviously, you know, that's, that's an important aspect of it, but then how do we reach those, uh, those populations as artists who, who don't have that connection with the arts, um, maybe as viscerally? Um, and, and a couple of the things I wanna, I, I wanna bring up here is just the, uh, number one, the idea of meeting them where they are. Um, you know, with that idea, um, in a couple of weeks, I, I, I will go down to San Antonio um, for, uh, what's the Air Force Base that's down there? Randolph, right? Randolph Air Force Base? I, yeah. So I'll go down to Randolph Air Force Base. Um, there's this event that happens annually, uh, Freedom Flyers Reunion. And um, the reason I go to it is because my uncle was, uh, was an Air Force pilot who shot down spent seven years in the Hanoi Hilton, came back, and every year for the last few decades, they gather there. And now, of course, my uncle is dead. He's been, you know, he's, he's, he's been dead for a couple of years. Um, but my father and a family friend have continued to go, and for the last four years since I've lived in Austin, I drive down there and I also go. And one of the amazing things that I find there is that, you know, these are all very, um, uh, the, 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 the people that are part of this Freedom Flyers reunion are all very military still, um, you know, even though they're retired. Um, they're, you know, they maintain their military bearing there when they're in the presence of everyone. But they're still telling stories, right? I mean, and, we, and this came up yesterday is that, yeah, maybe they're not telling it to the public, but when they get together, those stories do come out. Um, so they're doing the art there themselves in, in, in the presence of each other. So then the question becomes, how can we meet them where, they, where they're at? How can we get um, you know, in some of those spaces? Now, obviously, some of the spaces we can't get into, but how can we get into some of those spaces not as we're bringing this to you, you're coming to this, for, uh, uh, coming to this area or this space because of us, but we're coming to this space because of you, because you're telling your stories and those stories are amazing. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is playing the long game, um, especially when it comes to issues that are difficult for us to hear, um, like some of the stories that were in reentry, right? There's, there's some things in there that I, as a veteran, would you know, kind of recoil from a little bit. Um, how do we approach those stories and maintain our political sense of, you know, of, 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 all right, I have my identity, I know what my politics are, um, I'm going to, you know, listen to your, your politics knowing that I may not agree with them, and knowing that at some point in time I want to challenge them, but playing the long game and understanding that stories of empathy um, can actually do greater change than an immediate political assault you know, on, on, on those opinions. And so I think playing the long game becomes a very important part of, of, of this work. Oh, great, and I'm just gonna give us some order here. So, because I have a lot of hands. So it's gonna be Anthony, uh, and then it's gonna be Liz, and then uh, Moja, and then Linda, and then Madison, and then we'll go from there. Sorry, <laughs> that's, that's as many names as I can remember. <clears throat> um, uh, Sam, um, I, I think you mentioned something about um, uh, anti-military or government or, um, and that, that triggered this heating, this hot sensation in my chest that my holistic counselor told me that, you know, and being more in touch with my body, <laughs> that that's triggering something. So um, in, in, in reaction to that, um, our work, uh, the Comet Hippies was spoken word performance group of um, Latino and black uh, combat vets. And we struggled early on with sharing our narratives and the idea that speaking up about things we disliked about the military or the government is somehow makes us less patriotic. Um, we had a lot of discussions about that and continue to have those discussions. Um, I came to a point within myself where I said, these, these other performers, these men are my brothers, at, just like in the military, and that um, I support them and their freedom of this expression because we've served in the capacity to s support that freedom of expression um, on a grander scale and that I'm going to love him and support him <coughs> in sharing his truth and speaking it. Um, and we've kind of had to make peace with that and say that that will not resonate with everyone and that's okay. 
and that if we consider it art, some people are going to look at it like a painting and say, I love it. Others may look at it and go, I don't like that. And others might go, I just don't get it. So <laughs> we've made peace with that idea. Um, I just wanted to raise the collective consciousness on this idea of the impact of um, people of color who serve and that narrative needs to be further explored. And it's, it's challenging, it's scary, it's also exciting and it feels like um, an awesome responsibility to, to be a part of that work. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you for letting me have the microphone again. I just want to say I think artistic practice lets us hold our differences, our, our real differences. And when we, we had a residency at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, we were there for so a dance company in residence for 18 months in the shipyard. At the end was a, a week-long festival with an event every day on the yard and off the yard because the public wasn't allowed into the yard. One of the biggest issues for the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard is that it was on the toxic dumping list. So the community that lived around the yard, many people hated the yard because it's environmental contamination. The people in the yard, of course, had other, well, all kinds of things were going on. When we worked on that dilemma, it turned out that, um, so the question I have in my mind as an artist is, how do we stay open to influence? How long in our process, and how do we help people stay open to being influenced? So when we talk about these differences of opinions we have, yeah, we have them. I came to the yard with a, a lot of duress around the budget, the size of the budgets. But how and when can artistic practice and our skills around that help us hold ourselves to be open to influence so you can actually have the conversations? Turned out the yard was way open for it. The people who weren't were the environmentalists. Absolutely would not, they would talk to us, but they would not sit down with the yard. Wasn't that interesting? And so we ended up doing a performance at a church about reconciliation uh, where we dealt with this, but all we could have were the voices. We played the voices he said, she said, so you could hear the language. But uh, so we, I, I guess I'm, uh, what I'm coming back to is, are being open to influence? Yes, I came to the yard. I had very strong feelings. I expressed them. But in the manner in which those happened and with whom and how did we open up those so we could hear those differences. And that brings me to this wonderful discussion we just heard and from both Sam and Maurice about hearing about skills building. That uh, I love Madison said, you know, you just make a community and people, you know, I can play my trumpet again, get people in the room. These are not a dichotomy. Just getting people in the room and having a community is not, in di it's not a dichotomy against the fact that we also want to build skills. Victoria and I were talking last night, how hard is it to get people in the room? It can take months to get people into the room. That's a set of skills. Then we're in, and then there's this amazing evolution where you're really holding people, as you said yesterday, Sam, accountable. And I'll just say, when my work with old people started, there was a wonderful 84-year-old woman in the company. We were going into the schools doing shows. And they, each of the old, old, old people would get up and she'd go, I'm 84 years old, and she'd lift her arm up and everybody would applaud. And she, she came to me about three weeks in. She said, this is not enough. I'm just lifting my arm up. Give me something to do. It's not, don't coddle me. Challenge me. And I think that's also where we go with our differences. Challenge us to, you know, to, so I, I, and I'm back to just artistic pract practices as this wealth of skills that we're hearing from and building. So anyway, thanks. Great, Emoja, Linda, then Madison. And then okay, Susan. yeah, Quincy Jones, uh, I think some 12 years ago, he wanted there to be a secretary of the arts uh, to be part of the administration. And, you know, there was a movement going on, there was petitions to be signed and all that kind of thing. And, and I think primarily what I'm saying is, how do we, how does the art community not necessarily only portray or work with veterans in trauma? How do we try to circumvent this? And this, I pray this is not redundant, but this is what I'm feeling, is that Johnson, Lyndon Johnson did not feel comfortable running for a second term. So he 
said, I'm not going to do it. George Bush felt comfortable going into Iraq. So we have to make people feel comfortable when they're doing right or doing something that's life-giving and life-sustaining, and we have to make them feel uncomfortable, uncomfortable when they do something that we have to spend 50 years trying to make up for. We're going to have to do something anyway. We're going to have to do something anyway. We're going to spend the next 100 years coming here, where are we going to be? I don't know if I'll be here or not. I'll probably be gone. But, you know, we have to be expressing this and saying this and, well, you know, that kind of thing. But I'm really truly saying I feel, you know, because I'm in a lot of sessions all the time with a lot of different people. We have the power. We don't exercise it because we don't believe we do. That's why we don't believe we do. We don't think that we do. We, we think that we're limited. And, and so if we think we're limited, then we're limited. It's just that simple. It's not complex. If you think you're a star, then you're a star. If you think you're a piece of trash, then you're a piece of trash. Because you act that way. We all act that way. And the star is at certain places, and a piece of trash is at another place. So it's not that real complex. So I'm saying that we have, and I appreciate Linda Ferris Bailey and her husband Emmanuel, the whole carpet bag staff and the whole carpet bag uh, aggregation because I've been given an opportunity to go a lot of places and meet a lot of people and grow. That's important because I'm growing here. When I go back home to Knoxville and talking about locally, we have five people running for city council. Before they could join this movement, we call it the 2017 City Council Movement. In our city, it's going to be five people elected to City Council because the five that are there are term limited. So three years ago, we started working on 2017 to get five people who are going to handle a $400 million budget to see how we can make change. So I'm saying we can do it. You just have to think you can do it. You have to pray on it and fast on God Help me do this, and we can make a change. You, you know how um, you think you're going to say one thing, and the conversation rolls back around, and you, and you, and you know you're going to say something really different? Um, so this, this question of um, you know, how we all uh, come together and to make change. Um, I think the realization, uh, and you know, I, I approach this from, um, you know, uh, the point of view of somebody talked about being a, 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 a demonstrator and, you know, I was a peace activist. I continue to be a peace activist. Um, but the dilemma is, and this phrase keeps coming to me, the degrees of separation are small. You know, um, they seemed, when I was growing up and every male cousin I had, you know, was going to Vietnam. And we were talking about, you know, it was it Canada, is it Vietnam? Um, we were very present with that. And then I think there was a time when we got disconnected from that. And it, it really didn't matter it mattered to me personally, but it didn't really matter what your politics were because the reality was what it was. Um, and I think as we got kind of disconnected from it, we forgot about there's only that much separation between you and someone in the military, that much. We went from those people who were drafted to those young people who are going into the military because it's an employment opportunity. And just as my cousins went, my nephews are now going, right? So there's just this much separation. So it's the belief that we can change, of course, but it's also being able to, to stimulate these conversations. And that's, you know, that's really what it, for me, what it comes down to. And to look at that small degree of separation and continue this dialogue every day. Because, you know, we got to be about saving people's lives, whether they're returning veterans or they're people going to war. That's it. 
Hey, Madison. So I just want to get to um, Michael's point on something that real practical um, that we can take home to bring to our projects. So I do a lot of work with engineers and artists, and um, a lot of train wrecks happen um, because we don't speak the same language. Um, being in academia, um, you have lots of acronyms. Military, lots of acronyms. And there's an assumption that everybody knows what everybody is saying and nobody does. And no one's gonna say that they don't know the subculture language, right? So you don't wanna make people feel stupid. And that's what happens. And that's why people kind of slowly would disengage from a project. Every culture, every community has a language. Um, so the first thing I do for every project is we start a lexicon. And as soon as someone says something, we write it down and then we define it. Not only what the letters mean, but what it means means, right? Because Semper Fi, you know when I say that, what I'm really saying, you know, you can actually translate that always faithful, but usually when I say it, I'm saying it a little tongue in cheek, right? Semper Gumby. So um, to be clear, we have, to, we have to acknowledge that. And so we make a list and we're actually trying to build an open source platform to support um, collecting this language um, because it's a disparity and it's, and it's a block. Beyond the acronyms, when I say collaborate and when a technologist says collaborate and when someone from the military says collaborate, hell no, they do not say, mean the same thing at all at all, and we need to own that. And that's something really practical that I guarantee will improve every project. And if this group, as you are all working on projects, if there's a way that we can just share that through HowlRound, I know there's a lot of this, like it would be amazing um, to not have to spend that time to, to kind of make that lexicon. Thank you. Um, Susan Fader, um, first thank you to the group, um, just the intensity and the richness of this, particularly those of you that live and breathe it every day. Um, I'm just so appreciative to be uh, listening on this conversation. Um, I wanted to pick up on something Michael said a few minutes ago, that um, as, as an organization has been in this space for so many years, that many things have worked. Um, do we trust ourselves enough in this circle among our friends and colleagues to talk about the things that haven't worked so well? Because uh, I find I learn by the things that um, went awry along the way. Uh, so that's my first question. The second one is my funder question of what is it that we're not doing that we might do better? Thank you. Back there, and then I think we'll have one more. You're for, yeah, you're, you're up. Hey, hey everybody. I'm Bert from Carpetback Theater, hello. Uh, I am not a soldier. I portray one in Speed Kill My Cousin. I'm a soldier in the army of love, and I just want to say this. With art, whether it be performed dance, song, theater, literary, visual, poetry, there's so many forms. It, with art shared, it is a sense of church, it is a sense of protest. It is a sense, a strong sense of militia. It's a strong power in shared art. We must keep it alive. And I thank all of the presenters, all the people who in this room are healers, whether you know it or not. We must keep it alive. We have a new president, y'all. He is doing what we, he thinks is cleaning up America. We must make sure that our art is not time capsulized, a thing that we don't do anymore because it is, oh, we don't do art anymore because it's, it's either gonna become either black or white. And we don't want that to happen to America. We must sing, we must create, we must keep presenting, we must make art affordable for maybe if you do one night free one night, three dollars, one night, pay what you can if you perform. We must make sure that we keep art as church, as militia empowerment. That's all I have to say about that. Okay. Uh, Megan, you got the, yeah, go ahead. Hey everyone, I'm Megan. I'm here representing a Project Women at War from Rivendell Theater Ensemble in Chicago. And what a great conversation this is. Thank you so much. I'm full of a lot of different ideas. I wanted to jump in and say, um, you know, as a civilian and as an artist, and, um, you know, I was, I had a lot of reluctance 
coming to this project, but I felt compelled. Like I felt compelled to get involved because I had been hearing a lot of narratives that I felt were superficial or weren't really getting at um, truth and wanted to investigate that. And that's a big part of motivation for me as an artist. I think of myself as an investigator and an intermediary. Like that tone, that term really resonates for me in the field. And um, seven years now into doing this work, I feel uh, changed by it. I, it has been one of the most life-affirming, life-giving, uh, changing processes for me in terms of changed in my artistic process, absolutely, um, but changed as a person because I came in with a certain set of ideas and then um, you know challenged them and came to know different things and also because uh, we focused on women, but there are women in my life now who are not in my life, and they are they are friends, they're collaborators, and they're friends. You know, like we show up for each other, we know each other now, and being in those kinds of relationships has changed me. And so I'm thinking about that entry point of you know feeling compelled and how vulnerable I felt going into the space. And I guess the morning presentation and what I'm hearing today, just in this circle, um, has made me think about this challenge to get other civilians on board, right? And as a civilian, I feel like I'm in a position to do that, right? I can go talk to my people, you know? It's like, how do we change dominant culture ever when we're doing social justice work? How do we change the dominant culture? So as a civilian, how do I talk to other civilians about what happened to me and why I do this? And I think about all of the people, um, and it was funny to see one of the stories in the play this morning of, um, you know, the liberal theater folks who don't want to have this conversation. That's happened to me a lot. I've been in spaces where I want to talk about women at war and people just shut down and they want to talk about their activism and they don't want to hear anything about what I want to say. Um, and, you know, for political reasons. And so I'm interested in that. And today, I'm, I guess I just wanted to share out um, this conversation about how do we get civilians on board. And, I'm, and I'm, so I'm actively thinking about that. And... Um, those people who, um, not because they don't know about it, but who know about this work that I'm doing, that we are doing, and they choose to stay out of the room. And I'm curious about that, you know? And I just would want to talk to other people about um, what those stories might be, because as we're naming, we're living in a really fragmented time. And, you know, we're talking about veterans are really like streamlined and there are these programs with, you know, curricula and, you know, designs and you sign up and all that. Well, civilians are like off the hook. They're like out there doing their own thing. You know, there's no one like organizing. That. So how might we want to tap into networks to say like, what's, what's the reluctance there? Why are you staying out of the room? Why aren't you hiring? Why aren't you providing resources? You know, why aren't you opening the door to veterans when they're coming back? What are you afraid of? Um, and tap into that and open up the door to kind of explore what that vulnerability is. Um, so, thank you. Great, and just one final comment. Take it. Oh. Yeah. I, hi everyone, I'm Andrea Saf, Art to Action, and here with Carpet Bag Theater too. Um, so I'm feeling really challenged this morning, and I wanna try to pull together some threads uh, about challenge and risk and are there op topics off the table and what is political and um, going where we're afraid. Um, because uh, I was in a convening with Captain McGuire some months back where she was facilitating a session and asked the question, uh, what, are our, what were our stereotypes about veterans or assumptions uh, before doing this work or for those who hadn't, and, I, and I'm Arab American, and I stood up and I said, well, my, my assumption was that you're the enemy. <laughs> I mean, before I started working with veterans, the conversations in my community, right, the, that feeling in the chest that comes up that Anthony talked about, is um, I might think you, the military, are the enemy because I assume you think I'm the enemy, yeah? And so this conversation about othering and the political environment that we're in, I, I just have to say from earlier today, there is no such thing as artistic work that is not political. Representation is political. Anytime we get put anything in the public sphere, it is political. And so the question is, what is it that we're saying 
in relation to the political context that we're in, right? And so as an artist, this is, brings me to the role of the artist in society, right? As an artist, I go where I am afraid. I go where I feel challenged. I feel very challenged in these rooms all the time. I walk into a VA full of veterans, many of whom have served fighting people who look like me, and I'm scared. And then I look in their eyes and realize that they're scared that I just walked in the room <laughs> and that I'm facilitating something. And that we all get to be, and the, and the rehumanizing process, you know, what, what allows othering to occur, what allows war to occur is dehumanization, right? Um, the rehumanizing process is being able to go to those risky and challenging places together and be afraid and do it anyway, right? It's what artists train to do, and it's what the military trains to do. And so there are these really interesting places of common ground that help us, like Liz was saying about the skills that the artistic process brings, right? That help us go to those places where we can challenge and no topic is off the table and we must ask the hardest questions in order to create the best work and in order to heal together. Um, I'll stop there, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you everyone uh, for... Um, <laughs> the, a, a really wonderful conversation that we're gonna have more time. I know more of you have things to say and we'll have more conversation after we have some lunch. Jamie, uh, take it away. Thank you. Um, lunch is available in the lobby outside. It's um, boxed lunch. Feel free to eat in the lobby in here, walk around.